Um, if something comes to mind, uh, feel free to to put a message in the chat or speak up during a uh, during a transition period, and uh, we'll see about adding it in. Um, okay, so uh, announcements of Cloud Native Network Function Seminar at Open Source Summit is on August 28th uh, in the afternoon in Vancouver. So. Uh, if you haven't registered and you're intending to attend, uh, space is limited, so uh, the sooner the better. And um, Tom had a great point earlier as well. He, he wanted to attend the seminar, but was not as interested in attending the, the full summit. And um, in fact, he seemed to have found the compromise to paying the full cost of the of the summit which i think is a thousand dollars or close to it and that is to create to join in with a hall pass which is 150 and then you can sign up for the for the network function seminar as part of that so that may be a way around uh paying the full amount if you live nearby and don't want to have to pay the full the full quantity um okay special uh sure, special uh, one, one other thing to keep in mind there, and I did want to make this point very clear, when you do register, there is a special box that you click to indicate that you are also registering for that seminar. Um, and in the event that room gets too full, it's important to have clicked that box. Folks, I think today's the deadline and the rates go up in case you do want the full registration. I'm not sure if the rates will also go up for the hall pass or not. That's an excellent point, and I don't know the details behind that, but uh, yeah, literally the sooner the better, because as they, as they specifically stated, they're even asking people if they're not going to contribute uh, to the seminar actively, that uh, that they consider not not attending. Um, so, like, they actually put that in the in the next to the checkbox. So, so we need people who. Uh, who are knowledgeable, who want to want to speak up, and so on. So, you know, definitely check that box. Um, okay, so special announcements. Uh, Network Service Mesh was listed as the first highlighted session talk in the Linux Foundation's PR blast about the ONS Amsterdam uh, speaker schedule being announced. So they had a list of keynotes that... Um, that they were presenting, and then they said highlighted sessions include and network service mesh is listed as the first one. Uh, so pretty pretty happy with that. Uh, the link, if you want to see it or show it to people, is um, is in the meeting notes. Uh, and a bit of a of an interesting thing that we found through um, uh, that we found as well is at the same time that the cloud native function seminar is going on. Uh, VMworld is having a CTO panel that discuss that, that they're going to they have network service mesh on the agenda. So I'm not sure how they how they found network service mesh or or so on because we haven't been as as proactive on the marketing side yet. But um, we're starting to we're starting to get noticed and people are starting to talk about us. So um, so, so I have some background I have some background on that. Uh, I think I know how they found out about us. So, so in in addition to VMworld, VMware runs this FutureNet conference they've done for the last two years, and they're doing it um, again. It's kind of a smaller, uh, like invite only, you know, networking conference. I I gave a talk at this a few years ago. So this year I actually I tried to get a talk at FutureNet submitted. Now they moved it so it's only one day this year instead of two. So they they were pretty selective. So, so I think that's how they heard about uh, network service mesh because I was trying to get get us uh, get something on the agenda at that. Um, but uh, but I'll I'll still be attending that, so I plan to kind of talk about network service mesh on the hallway track for that as well. I can put a I can put a link to that in there too. Actually, maybe I should do that. That might not be a bad idea. Okay. Cool. Um... Let's see. Yeah, that that'd be good to add a link. Oh, I forgot to ask. Uh, can somebody share the uh, the agenda as well? That way, that just make sure everyone can see it. I can do that. Just a second. 
since Lucina is not with us today, she did it last time. Um, so I'm the poor substitute, but I'll do my best here. Just a second here. The screen. I'm slow. Lots of crap on my desktop. Cool. Thank you very much. Well, I'll, um... and okay. So, um, agenda items that we are tracking. So, uh, things that um, some of the highlights that we've gotten done uh, include the um, the getting started guide that. Um, um, Thomas Herbert has put together. So uh, it's it's quite detailed. Uh, we need people to give it a try, uh, make um, um, make recommendations on areas that uh, that can be improved in it. Uh, overall, I think the document is uh, is great, but there's also areas where uh, where uh, we can definitely get some some additional input. So I believe like. Uh, the focus was primarily on CentOS, so someone needs to fill out the Ubuntu sections and um, and so on. Uh, we've um, also added a ability to capture stack traces in in our on our errors plugin. So now when you now when you run Logris, you can put uh, the Logris pl plugin uh, that we have. Uh, then we can you can add in dot with stack. With stack trace dot error, and you put in whatever your error is, and it will automatically inject into the logging mechanism the uh, the stack trace of um, of the of the error. So definitely uh, definitely going to be useful. Uh, tied to that is we're going to move our errors from our, our actual error handling itself. Uh, to to be two parts. One of them is actual reporting is going to be through Logris. Uh, there's a project that we're bringing into the fold, uh, which is called Go Errors, which um, is which, which is, is a, a uh, error system. Quick quick comment, Tom. We can see the wind, the email you're composing. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but wanted to make sure you were aware. Sorry to interrupt, Frederick. Please go on. I uh, no no. That's important. Good point. Um, okay, so thanks, Ed. Uh, so, so we're moving over to uh, to a project called Go Errors. Uh, Go Errors are effectively uh, a better a better package for uh, manipulating and managing uh, and managing errors. And uh, that Go Errors is, is ultimately what pass what manages the stack traces for us. So it's an integration of the two. Uh, between Go errors and um, and Logris. Um, okay, so we also have had some uh, some uh, improvements on our SRILV path. Um, so I'll let uh, Sergey talk a little bit about uh, some of the work he's been doing with SRILV. Uh, right. <clears throat> so uh, there were a couple of um, a couple of um, directions. So the first direction was to uh, develop a tool which would scan a host and detect all uh, VFs defined or existing on that host and then put together a config map where all required information for, uh, for the controller will be placed. Um, and then there's a, 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 basically to, uh, since the tool cannot really understand if this VF belongs to this specific uh, network service, then there is an intermediary step where a user needs to edit that config map and map each VF to a desired uh, network service name. So once it's done, then this map will be instantiated. Basically, you create kubectl create minus f for that file. And then the controller detects the, uh, that's the second part. The controller detects, um, instantiation of the config map and uh, it create and advertise these resources to the kubelet. Once it's done, a pod 
can request um, SROV VF or multiple VFs by referring uh, to the network service in the resource section of the pod spec. Let's say you want to say resource and then network SROV and then you provide the uh, network, uh, network service name, let's say uh, uh, one, two, three, and then you end up in the, the, the pod with uh, four VFIO devices, which you can use at your pleasure. So that's, uh, I mean, the first part, it's pretty much completed. It's ready to be merged. Uh, the controller part, uh, it's almost done. Um, we oh, tested okay. yesterday, uh, VFIO device, which is in the container, is operational. Jan provided a uh, nice uh, testing tool. Uh, and I'm working on some cleanup and to add delete and update functionality. So when the config map gets updated, then the controller will detect it and react accordingly, removing or adding some advertisement for uh, uh, VFs. So that's pretty much. Yeah, th this is actually really important because th there's a segment of folks um, who are looking, who have use cases that network service mesh is, is seeking to solve, where um, they have use cases where being able to attach a pod that needs a network service to a SRIO VVF that is going to provide that service is a really, really important use case. So th this is you know, a really important thing to be able to do. Uh, I know that people are using SRIOV now in containers. Um, currently, I don't know how they're orchestrating, I think through the CNF. Um, but um, certainly there is, uh, there is a lot of interest and in giving people a migration path to uh, more portability with uh, other other data planes as well, perhaps so uh, all within the container and um, an NSM context. I think it's great. Yeah, th th there's another problem to solve that's actually really kind of critical. One of the problems that people are trying to figure out right now with getting an, SR an SRIOV VF into a container is, you know, an SRIOV, not all SRIOV VFs are created equal, right? They they have different characteristics, they connect to different things, etc. And so there's a group of people right now who are actually trying to add the uh, effectively the SRIO VVF information directly into the pod spec, which is kind of ugly and messy. Um, you know, so you literally name a particular VF on a particular host, and that's kind of ugly. Uh, this is nice because it, it meshes well with how the current Kubernetes scheduling uh, works, and it also allows you to address the VF as a network service, which is a logical entity. So, you know, when you bring up a new node that you, you know, just taking a, a very simplistic example, if you've got a radio network and you have a bunch of VFs on a bunch of nodes that are able to reach that radio network, now you can simply say, look, um, I need this resource, which is the radio network service as a hardware resource, uh, sorry, the hardware resource and get scheduled to a pod where one is a node where one is available and get connected up with that. So I, I think this ends up being really, really good because it's so much simpler than having to track the names of the VFs on all the, all the nodes and try and schedule that way. Yeah, so, so in short, um, we're, we're moving we're getting some some good traction with getting SRV on board, so uh, pretty excited about that overall uh, about that overall path. Uh, let's see, we've also we also have uh, work being done to publish images on Docker Hub. Uh, Kyle's been uh, focusing on that. Uh, can you give an update? Yeah. So after a bit of a false start this week. Uh, I, I've got a pretty good path forward, uh, especially after talking to Sergey today. So I think what I'm going to do is create kind of an NSM Docker Hub ID, and then in in the Travis in Travis CI in the control panel, we can actually um, we can actually put the credentials for that there, um, and then we should be able to pull uh, what we need to be able to push from Travis directly that way. Um, after talking with Sergey today, he's he said he's seen this done this way for a bunch of other different projects as well. So, so Frederick, it turns out the, the patch that I had that I closed, the, or the pull request, I should be able to reopen that, removing the, the hashed credentials from there. 
um, and, and get this work in later this afternoon. I see. So, so where exactly do the credentials end up living then? They they end up being stored in the Travis uh, in the Travis uh, UI. So, so they end up being stored that way. Okay. And yeah. apparently, Travis does not dump these in logs anywhere, uh, from what I can tell. So, you know, it won't it won't accidentally spittle those out um, that way. Yeah, my, my only concern with it is if it's passed into an environment variable or something similar, uh, and it's run and it runs through a uh, commit, uh, like on any, any pull request that someone could do echo network service mesh password. And um, yes, and Th that is after. that's my concern as well, and that's the thing I need I want to verify to make sure that 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 somehow they, there's a way to ensure that we that type of malicious behavior we can't uh, you know that they don't allow. I know that Travis has mechanisms for doing that, um, effectively for making sure the variable is only set when when the job is run and you know for for certain purposes in, in certain you know by certain users in certain ways. Um, I I remember looking into it at one point and being kind of impressed with how well they handled it, but definitely something to check out and make sure we get right. Yeah, and best case scenario, I think if we set it so that it's only on um, merge uh, merge master or merge or merge to a specific uh, branch, then I think we should be good. It's just, we don't want arbitrary echoing of, of the password. Exactly, yep, totally agree. So I'll, I should be able to, you know, hopefully get that, verify all of this and, and figure that out and maybe get something pushed out uh, this afternoon. Cool. Uh, okay, uh, Ed, uh, you have something called simple start to device plugin. Uh, I'll let you discuss. Hang on, let me do take a quick look at it. Um, simple start to device plugin. We, oh, we can... yeah. So this, this is a work in progress. I was factoring out a so we, we, we API in a bunch of places, um, and I was in, we expect to use it in more. And so I was looking at uh, factoring that device plugin. I, factoring the device plugin piece of the work for Kubernetes device plugin out into a reusable plugin that could be used other places. Um, this has the potential to be not only really good for us, but really good for a lot of people. Because right now, when people write a device plugin, they go sort of hack it out by hand. And having looked at quite a few device plugins, the quality of the device plugins in terms of their handling of the standard device plugin stuff varies wildly, device plugin device to device plugin. So hopefully this would make things relatively easy for people who need to write device plugins and not just for us. Are you muted, Frederick? I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, great. So we, um, yeah. Th thanks for thanks for the uh, the update on that. So definitely looking forward to to seeing the um, the pull requests. Um, okay. So we have a task that set here for adding sidecar containers in uh, network service mesh, and uh, it shows uh, uh, Pratik is being um, has been blocked. Uh, is there something that is is there something that you're still blocked on? Yeah, so this is related to the bug in Minikube. So once we move to packet where we are running the actual Kubernetes clusters, so there uh, we should not have any uh, problem there. But uh, as a workaround, I was thinking I can comment out the CI CD uh, the CI part of the of this pull request and the actual functionality can go in. And once we either the Minikube bug gets resolved or we move to packet for Kubernetes cluster, then I can enable the CI again if that it works. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, if you, if, you, if, you, if you need any help or anything with that, uh, um, let, let us know and we'll, we'll jump in and do, what, and do what we can. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, we, right, just, just for, the, uh, for the overall epic, um, when it, so we we have the we're working on publishing images to Docker Hub. Once images are are published, 
our daemon sets are pretty much all set up so that we should be able to pull from them. And uh, that'll, that should make the overall path to testing on, uh, on the packet CNCF cluster uh, viable at that, um, at that point. So, so once we, once we get to that, then uh, the pack, the CNCF cluster random packet should become available for, for testing these kind of things. So, mm -hmm. So, shall I just keep it in this state, or uh, un, un, or, or comment out the CI portion, the testing portion for now, and let the PR go? In? My recommendation would be to get it in now, and and the reason why is that uh, if there's any refactoring, we we would uh, it's better to to have this patch in and have it refactored with everything else uh, rather than sure. having to have you go back and do a lot of rework because things have changed. So. Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, network service mesh uh, mascot. Um, I think Ed had some some comments on this. Uh, I, I I I'm getting pretty good feedback on uh, Ariande, the spider, uh, which I think is good. At some point, we'll have to get someone to redraw um, Ariande the spider because while we do have the legal right to use it. I got it properly from a stock photo site. Um, we don't have the, um, we don't currently have, we, we wouldn't be able to use it for a trademarked thing. So we will eventually need to get it redrawn. So if folks know good artists, that would be a useful thing to know. Um, but people seem pretty happy with it. Uh, Ed, I mean, uh, before, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I mean, I, I do know a good artist, but I'm curious if there are, I mean, uh, I won't be able to ask to do it just to do it. I mean, are you planning to have any incentive for the uh, artist? Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the things we need to figure out over time as we mature a little bit. Uh, it kind of relates to, I think, another item we have where we're exploring uh, becoming like a Kubernetes working group or something like that. And once we have some kind of a formal role in the CNCF, they will typically have some funding for this sort of thing. And that would also give us access to the Linux Foundation's Creative Resource Group if we would like to as well. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm all about not asking artists to go do work for free. Their work is of value. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um... So we've already spoken on the uh, SROV side. So uh, do we want to talk more about uh, the Kubernetes workgroup uh, member process? Um, I'll let you work. Yeah, yeah. so basically we're, we, we are trying to, so we, we've gotten feedback um, from SIG Networking about the coming of Kubernetes work, working group. Um, Right now, I think the thing we're trying to do is to put together the, hey, we'd like to be considered as a working group email, um, and sort of trying to work out drafting that. Uh, and then we'll have to see how that goes. Um, the other thing is Tim Hawken, who's been a great supporter of ours, has been out for the last few weeks, and he's going to be getting back. So I expect to start turning the wheels on that shortly. OK, fantastic. <laughs> So, um, see, so going down the line, uh, document infrastructure. There's no updates to to that. Uh, for those who were not present in the previous meeting on this, uh, basically, we want to run our documentation with Hugo, uh, and basically generate some uh, some nice and well laid out uh, documentation for our users over time. So, if anyone wants to help out with that, uh, any help is uh, is. Uh, Highly appreciated. Uh, I have a document that I'm writing up on how to get a on how to gain a, a privileged container uh, to an existing container. So this document effectively effectively what it is is if you run a pod, the pod runs without privileges, and and, and privileges is, is effectively root on the system. And so in order to add capabilities. So for example, if you wanted to add an interface, you need to have access to at least some, at least a privilege like NetAdmin in order to, in order to do so. And so I have a, I have a document how, that outlines how do you spin up a new container that can bind to the pod's network uh, namespace and uh, have 
NetAdmin access so that these changes can be can be made um, and made in a way that uh, does, that is not where the user themselves don't have access necessarily, but more uh, just from the network service mesh side in order to protect the uh, security of the of the cluster. Uh, uh, Frederick, I have a question. I mean, uh, based on the past discussions we had, uh, like Ed and myself, it seems that the direction was uh, that the NSM runs kind of a privileged container and does all the plumbing on behalf of the client. In this case, client basically doesn't need any privilege to um, and no need to create any, any interfaces. NSM will be doing that for the client uh, based on the requested uh, services. Is there a kind of a direction change uh, since, I mean, you're talking now about the client doing some some interface related work? Oh, um, the, the, uh, let me let me clarify. So the client itself doesn't do doesn't do the work. Uh, so it would still be ran and owned by network service mesh uh, infrastructure itself. So so that hasn't changed. Uh, what is in the long run? Uh, it, it, it would be it would be best to reduce the total number of quantity of security uh, mechanisms that um, that the daemon has access to so for example if for some reason the daemon was compromised uh, we can minimize the the impact and so one way to do that is to reduce the overall set of, of privileges and it's also it also may end up simplifying certain certain tasks like we want to add an interface instead of having the, the network service mesh bind temporarily to that namespace or, or running commands that have to or manage what namespace it's it's uh, manipulating uh, it can spin up a pod that has net admin that is capable of running the command on behalf of network service mesh, or not, not a pod, but a container, uh, but it would be fully owned and controlled by, by network service mesh itself. So the, the pod and client would not have any privileged uh, access at all. So it's, it's more about like refining the, the, current, uh, the current path a little bit more. And if it makes sense to, to move off in this direction, then that'll be helpful. And there's also a, another benefit as well, where if you're developing uh, a, uh, if you're developing a, a VF or CNF for, the, for, for this, and you want it to experiment, it also helps a lot in the experimentation side because you can add routes manually, you can delete routes, you can, add interfaces and wire things up so it so it helps uh, it helps from that respect as well okay got it thank you okay uh, so there was also a nsm enhancement proposal uh, that was uh, that was added um, Ed, uh, do you want to do you want to say anything on uh, on that particular topic? I, I, I think so. The proposal reads about get, being a CNCF project, uh, which is certainly among the formal options that are available to us. I think at this time, uh, the recommendation from C Networking has been pretty strong that they would like to see us as a Kubernetes working group, um, or as a fallback as a Kubernetes subproject under C Networking. Um, you know, but but with a strong preference for Kubernetes working group. So. Um, my guess is that we will proceed as a Kubernetes working group unless something goes awry there. Uh, do folks have other thoughts or opinions or feelings on the subject? Actually, reading into the uh, Git into the GitHub issue, it's uh, something a bit different. So this is actually from the Volk uh, group uh, talking about the write up of how NSM could help with CNCF uh, CNF project. So my my apologies. Uh, uh, I apologize. I didn't and, hear that. Presume, so. I, I don't see Taylor on the call, but I do see Watson on the call. And um, uh, Watson, is this something that you can uh, that you can discuss, or should we just punt it till next uh, next meeting? Probably want to wait till uh, Taylor and Lucy get back um, on that. Okay, we will uh, we will wait on that then. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so there was also a new uh, a new issue that was added about separating out the concerns for audiences of NSM to make it accessible uh, by Dunehammer. Um, are are you on the call? So 
So we, we do seem to be missing I, I don't John. see John. Yeah, yeah, we do seem to be yeah. missing him. I, I think it's overall um, a good point, though. Uh, Fred, do uh, you want me to scroll down to the action items from from uh, last week? There's, I think you're actually reviewing them, and there's a huge list. I'm still looking at this. Yeah. At this. So there, there, there's there's a link there's a link in the agenda to a, a, a project board that he's actually reading from. Oh, okay, okay. And it'll actually share the board that we're walking down progressively. Yeah, where the hell is that? Whoops. Uh, yeah, Lucido was. Yeah, that was will organize that for us and oh my god is it better oh yeah okay yeah that would be better but i've actually never it's uh it's brand new so uh, uh it's the first item under action item tracking where there's a link to the projects board at github oh yeah okay sure um anyways it's um we have about 20 minutes left on the call so um my recommendation is let's talk about onboarding. Uh, uh, let's talk about onboarding OSS and ONS uh, uh, newcomers and work out how we can best um, help new people who are looking at the project understand what network service mesh is and how they can um, how they can contribute in various ways. Uh, so one suggestion that uh, that uh, Ed had was we add a uh, landing page that we can that we can direct people to. You wanna you wanna discuss, discuss that? that? Yeah. So one of the things that's come about is um, I've been asked to present about twenty minutes on network service mesh at the seminar, and one of the things that you can do that I like to do with your slides is you can put QR codes on them for links so that people can pull up their, their camera phones and take pictures. Um, and the QR code automatically gets recognized and takes them to the page. Um, so if we have a landing page that actually is, is sort of tailored for that audience, um, you know, and this sort of gets to the separate out concerns for audiences of NSM, that audience is going to be very, very focused on NFE, which is an important use case for us, but it's not the only use case for us. Um, you know, basically that gives us the opportunity to have a place for them to land and to, um, and sort of proceed from there. And, and we might think about what other things we might want to do to help capture the interest of the audience from that landing page. I think uh, something else that we should add into it as well is if we hear certain ideas or concerns uh, come up during the talk, even if they're not answered in the talk themselves, uh, we can use that landing page as a way to engage uh, people afterwards and, uh, and answer questions or correct misconceptions. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's actually probably a good idea. You know, my experience, I, I tend to give incredibly conversational talks. And my experience is you learn more from the audience than the audience learns from you about how they, how they are understanding what you were saying and the kinds of misconceptions that arise. And that makes it easier to communicate in the future. Um, and, and so particularly if we could get somebody who is there in the audience who'd be willing to do a sort of blow by blow live update of the page, that's also really amazingly compelling in terms of people feeling like the community is engaged with the audience. So we'll have to add that as an action item to work out um, uh, who's gonna be there and out of who's gonna be there, who's willing to take on that role. Are we looking to do that to do that now? I mean, I, I'm planning, I'll be there on Tuesday for that session as well. Um. Yeah, so I mean, I, that, that might actually be, you know, I, I think just having a couple folks in the audience who can, you know, push, re, quickly push review and merge PRs as we get questions and can provide, big, you know, basic answers to them. Um, like I said, that, that shows a really strong commitment to engaging with your audience at that point which I think will actually make us look extremely collaborative. Yep, definitely agree. So another, um, another thing that I think we should be prepared for, like we don't have to flush, we don't have to, to get a full setup now, but if we start talking about it, like the entire the entire open source uh, CNF thing is talking about what is a, a CNF, and uh, it's it's a pity the Volk uh, group at the moment is um, 
is not here at the moment because I think that this would be a really great topic for him and I'll make sure to bring this up with him uh, later on. Uh, but one of the things that really helped on the Kubernetes side for app developers is they had this set of uh, heuristics that they call 12-factor apps. And if you follow the heuristics of a 12-factor app, ideally you end up with something that can scale horizontally and fits very well within the Kubernetes model. And what one of the things that I think we can do is we can do something similar on the CNF side and say, like, you know, I have 12 factor apps, maybe we have 10 factor CNFs or something similar to that, uh, that are basically a set of heuristics that, um, that help people build scalable CNFs on, um, on their clusters or uh, that their clusters can be controlled, uh, that their CNFs can be controlled by. And so, um, so I think that, like that particular conversation, you know, start thinking about what type, like, what does it mean to be to be a CNF, and like, how can we get that horizontal horizontal scalability? Because, and just to drive the point, uh, if you look at like why we're why we're here, one of the reasons is you start looking at the scalability scalability issues of trying to drive through the monolithic DNFs. And uh, how, how is that going to scale when we start to hit 5G edge Internet of Things based traffic? And having a system that is capable of horizontally scaling becomes very, very compelling. And so we're going to have to have uh, re architecture or rewrites of VNFs to CNFs. And this particular crowd. Um, absolutely fantastic when it comes to understanding the network side and, and how things traverse through there. But a lot of that expertise and how do you build horizontally scalable apps is, um, is more in the enterprise, is more in the enterprise side and, uh, and app developers. So we can take some of our knowledge from the app developer side and help, help avoid mistakes that, um, uh, that they made and learn from, uh, if, while we're developing CNFs. So, uh, so in essence, I, I, what I'm proposing is that we, is that we start coming up with a set of heuristics to help drive what, what does it really, what does it really mean to be a, to be a CNF? And we try to draw in other groups and, and organizations who can, who can help with that. Uh, does, does that make sense? Totally. Yeah, I think that's actually a really great idea because I, I kind of feel like that type of guidance and, and what you're suggesting is going to be broadly useful. Um, so if we can, if we can have something like that to, to, to frame that discussion, I think it's going to be really useful in, at that Tuesday session. Yeah. And, and this is, this is going to be a little bit more difficult than the 12 factor app approach uh, because the 12 factor app, uh, how do you horse, how do you horizontally scale a system? Uh, a, a web app is already relatively well understood. Uh, it was just a matter of, you know, getting this message out for people to, uh, to head in that direction. Uh, we're we're going to have a, a more interesting time with this because we're talking instead of just one group of people that we're targeting, it's like app developers. We're, we're targeting multiple multiple groups and from multiple industries who all have intertwined interests and intertwined uh, uh, requirements, uh, but are subtly different enough that one set of heuristics may not work for for everyone. So so we have to think carefully on on this type of guidance. But I think this type of guidance is going to be. Uh, is, is going to be something that is absolutely necessary to to help progress the industry forward at a faster at a faster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th th this is actually a really crucial point because Cloud Native asked everybody to rethink. Um, so when, when you went from from physical boxes to Cloud 1.0, um, it was a lift and shift mentality, right? You slapped a V in front of all the existing things, and away you went. Um, Cloud Native asked everybody to actually think again for the first time in decades about how you actually write and deploy applications because there was a new space of possibility that it was not previously there. Um, I think what we're gonna find as we go to cloud native NFV um, with you know, writing proper CNFs and that kind of, with network service mesh is that it is going to require thinking about things differently than we thought about them when they were just physical boxes. And even when we thought about them just as, you know, slap a V in front of network function and call it good. 
And, and so good crisp guidance on, on how to fit, rethink things is going to be something that's going to be helpful. It's also going to be a much more interesting process, I think, of the 12-factor app guys, because 12-factor app basically is a codification of things that people figured out by experience. And we're going to have a lot of collaboration with early adopters who are going to be figuring a lot of this out by experience themselves. Um, and, and so it will be naturally a bit more fluid um, than 12-factor apps was, because 12-factor app was, apps was mostly putting structure around what were already well understood good practices. And we're actually going to have to collaborate together as a community to figure out what those practices look like. Yeah, there's um, an interesting side thing to that, Ed is, and Fred is, uh, people thinking about microservices and, and, um, and, and network functions being part of a microservice mesh people start to get worried that the microservices mean that we're going to be forwarding packets back and forth, little slow uh, things that will slow down the actual network. And that's not necessarily the case. There's one thing is the orchestration plan that will allow us to take a network function and perhaps scale it in bits, but, but, the, but it, it will have to be written in such a way that we, we don't accidentally funnel some kind of, um, you know, funnel the actual uh, data plane packets through, um, through uh, a, an interface that they shouldn't go through, which will, slow, which, which will uh, in effect slow the functionality down. But I think those are challenges in the future. Yeah, one, uh, one example I've been using uh, for this exact uh, point is you start looking at IoT devices with radios in them where they're communicating to some central controller. Uh, and if that communication is uh, managed and controlled by uh, network service mesh, uh, one option that we have is if, the, if you have two IoT devices that are, that are located close to each other, then we could direct both devices to go direct with each other over the radio for a certain period of time so that they can get um, uh, as quick as possible, eliminate, you know, a point to point with each other. And once the, once they're done or their lease expires and they come back to network service mesh and, and continue to coordinate their, their network. And uh, when you start looking at some of the challenges that are involved with that, you know, it's like, how do you pick which frequency they should they should communicate with? How do you, uh, how, what happens if you have interference and and uh, or one of them moves away? And so when you start looking from from that perspective, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that we can help solve uh, within that particular data plane. And one of the nice things about it is is it drives the point that those uh, those connections, those IoT devices don't have to go through a container through the Kubernetes cluster, but they can still be managed by network service mesh and still be part of a larger picture. And so uh, I think that's a fantastic point that, uh, that you've brought up that we, we have to, we have to drive the point that we, we can go, we can be part of the data plane in terms of the CNFs that join up, but we don't, but network service mesh itself is, is not part of the data plane. It, it coordinates things that are data planes or that are connected to data planes. So, so we don't sit in that, we don't sit in that path and slow everything down. Um, is there any other ideas that people can, uh, that people can think of in terms of onboarding uh, OS, OSS and, uh, and ONS uh, newcomers? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to add a couple uh, a couple items onto the agenda uh, onto the agenda so we can track them later on. So we need to continue our improvements on uh, documentation, make sure everything's up to date, uh, call things that are not uh, that are not up to date, uh, or or update them. Uh, and Fred, um, just if I could break in here and show sure. my social skills, uh, we uh, we had discussed that before, and I was just looking. I just had the uh, the board up uh, with the issues on the uh, what do we what we call this the, the network service mesh board, and we really probably why don't you specifically say write up an issue for those for those two things, improvements with documentation and also 
refactoring, getting started guide with a, with a real true quick start. Those are really related, but, but different issues. And I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to write up the both issues on those to track them. I was supposed to do that, but I haven't yet. I'm sorry, there's a, too much words to say or something. Like that. Oh, no worries. And uh, thank you very much for helping on this. Like uh, the, this, this type of work is going to be invaluable. Like once we start getting these people uh, looking at it. So, you know, any, any improvement we have on here is, is going to, is going to help drive, drive the community. Okay. Well, um, is there, is there anything else that, uh, that anyone would like to bring up on this topic or any other topics? Okay, um, I have one last request as well. Uh, if you if you intend to uh, to work with Network Service Mesh uh, and 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 you're willing to give a presentation at KubeCon, uh, the the deadline I believe is on August twelfth. So get your get your abstracts in if that's something you're interested in. So. I know that we've had some interest with uh, with some of the open daylight people who have wanted to are talking about putting together a a uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it'd be fantastic to have others uh, join in as well and talk about your your use cases or uh, or where you want to go. So, and with that, I don't have anything else on the agenda. So, thank you everyone for your time and. Uh, Feel free to join us on Network Service Mesh on IRC and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks.